confused. Um, so let me just, uh, I looked in, in the experiments to see what reversible and irreversible is. So the point is, if I go to very high packing fraction, high uh, tapping strength, like if I, uh, if I tap at a very large amplitude, right, that's what they're controlling. It's gamma is some measure, you know, 16 times G or something. So they're vibrating a column. And if they're vibrating it at a very large gamma, then it's very easy to reach a steady state density. So they reach some density, which is, which is here, let's say. But if they do, uh, if they start from arbitrary initial states and shake at a much lower strength, then you might get these. So what they did to get the reversible irreversible is very similar to what I would do if I thought of gamma as temperature and tried to anneal. So what they did was they went up to the very high tapping strength, created a steady state, and then, then started shaking it, but at lower and lower strengths, but lowering the strength very slowly. It's like re lowering the temperature very slowly. And if you lower the temperature very slowly, then you follow this reversible path. And then if you increase the tapping strength again, you follow this path. Whereas if you start from um, a very low density packing and then the, the shake at a low amplitude, you might end up here. So it really is, it, it's to me, it's like uh, uh, taking something um, and increasing its temperature very, uh, very quickly, right? Or decreasing it very quickly, like a glass and quenching it. So this, they actually use the language that this has fallen out of equilibrium. It's sort of like a glass state, which is, should have stayed on that path, but because of, uh, of not being able to find the appropriate states, falls out of equilibrium. So, the, so it's, it's interesting. And the thing, the reason I went back to looking at it is the more recent experiments that we were discussing yesterday, which uh, tested the Edwards ensemble, is done here. I was very confused because their packing fraction was going down with tapping uh, strength. And so then I looked, and so they, they are doing it here. So in this reversible region, about, at a reasonably high tapping strength, looks like this Edwards idea is, is, is valid. Now, what happens out here, I, I think is still up for grabs. So I just wanted to mention that because if you read the, the paper, this paper, the recent paper, and I will, I will upload this older 1997 paper. It's a very nice paper, describes things very, there was this confusion in my head as to how was here with increasing tapping strength. If I start from very low packing fractions, then it increases. Um, also, I think this has something to do with the microstructure inside. And this goes back to Abhishek, what you were saying, if it's a Poisson distribution or not. Because in soil mechanics, there's this concept of a critical state. So if you start from a very high, very compressed soil and you shear it, it will go to a lower density. If you start from a very low density, it goes into that critical into that same density, which is sort of asymptotically reached. So if you imagine what this state would be as gamma goes to infinity, that in soil mechanics is sort of called the critical state. But that seems lower than the, this, this peak, which I, I don't understand. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I understood the reversible, irreversible, and where the experiments are, the recent experiments are being done. So I just wanted to share that with you. Any questions on that? Okay. Ma'am. Yeah. Ma sure. So here, uh, reversible and irreversible, that is distinguished just by the rate, uh, CA rate. 
it's, it's no it's the ramping of uh so it's like <clears throat> so they start from a very um so it's how slowly or rapidly you increase or decrease gamma okay right so so if i if i say okay i'm going to um it's like uh, how rapidly it's it's analogous to how rapidly or slowly i increase temperature right if i want to go to some del delta t um by in 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 one hour or in one second so here they're increasing delta gamma let's say over a thousand a thousand time steps which are taps for them or uh or one time step right so that's that's what determines whether it's reversible or irreversible you're coming to the same value of gamma it's just are you coming at it quickly or or slowly like are you set letting the the system anneal um which is a, a word that we use in temperature annealing right we slowly it decrease the temperature or slowly increase the temperature so that's that's the distinction. Okay, so Bulbul, I mean, this is uh, this is very generic. Is it this curve? I mean, yeah, this curve I think is very is is generic. I yeah. don't know how uh, what very is in, in the sense that there is um, uh, there is the uh, sort of this the, the presence of metastable states. Okay. So I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, what it says is that if I want to pack a lot of sugar, then I should follow this protocol, right? I keep increasing you gamma. Should, and then you go should back. go to, exactly, and then so that it follows that upper curve. Okay. But then uh, I don't think there's very much understanding of what the microstructure is that lets you pack, right? What you know, what the microstructure is up there. There is, I think, there are some molecular dynamic simulations. But not something that I have paid very much attention to. But to me, it's interesting, right? That in this range of gamma, you do have uh, lots of metastable states. You know, it's analogous to spin systems like random fieldizing models, etc. Sanjeev, right? Where you have so many states. It's this sort of classic hysteresis, right? Or even memory, right? So people now that think about memory in sand it's it's how you're encoding memory through structure i'm sure, but i don't i haven't kept up enough to know if people have looked carefully at the origin of these metastability okay so i want to move to um a slightly different way about uh, thinking about granular materials today. So yesterday, <laughs> yep. About yesterday's talk. Uh huh. Sure. Uh, so what exactly? How exactly is the volume conserved? In a sense, uh, with every tap, the volume is gonna change, right? Even if it's a microcanonical, and I mean, you have a bunch of particles in a box. Uh, with every tap, the volume will change. But how is the volume conserved? Oh, so volume conservation is just like energy con. So okay, so the concept of what, right? So just like, of course, right? If I increase the temperature of a system, its energy is going to go up. But suppose you create, um, so at every gamma, at every tap, you have a different packing fraction. But let me say, okay, I look at that. I add that gamma. I look at my system right and it has a total volume let's say the voronoi volume sure. yeah yeah so then the 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 conservation is this idea that if i now look that this system is isolated from the rest of the universe right just like when we do with energy right so the energy then is conserved so the so anything that happens inside this box cannot change this v total that's the conservation. Yes, but uh, like uh, physically, how how could someone create this? Because at so so right so at a given uh, tapping strength, 
um, you do reach a steady state. Like you, you that the 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 picture I was showing you here is the average density at this tapping strength. So if I actually looked at rho at this tapping strength as a function of time, then it's going to fluctuate about that. Yes, yes. So very much like, right, if I reach a particular temperature and I'm looking at energy, there's an average energy and then it fluctuates about it. It's the same way here, the density is fluctuating about some average. So this is just the average density. Okay, okay. But the, in microcanonical ensemble, the energy is a complete, I mean, it's constant. It doesn't have any fluctuations, right? Correct. But, but here- uh, so Microcanonical, we can never reach, right? We never, even even normally, I cannot ever explore okay, yeah. a system because as soon as I touch it, I have coupled to something. Yes, okay. So it's a concept then that, and that's the reason that the Edwards uh, idea is thought to be useful, right? That I cannot create a system at a constant V, but if, um, if this is true, that the probability of finding uh, the positions of hard sphere particles actually is given by e to the minus volume of that configuration over some compactivity by the partition function, then I can presumably create a state with a given compactivity. And presumably there is some equation of state that connects V and X just like I can connect E and T, that's an equation of state, right? So I can always create systems with a given temperature. So the, the Edwards idea is then, okay, may, you can create uh, systems with a given compactivity. Okay, yes. Uh... So that's the analogy. Okay, so basically, but here we are in a canonical ensemble, not a micro canonical ensemble, right? When we say this? When we do the gamma experiment? Uh, yes. This I, is a canonical example. This is this yeah, is a canonical yeah. distribution. But the like construction comes from the micro canonical. Absolutely. Right? Just like it does in, uh, well, again, you can do it two ways, right? Um, you can start from the micro canonical ansatz and say, okay, I have a fluctuation in the volume here or the energy here. So the volume fluctuated up by something here. It has to fluctuate up down by that outside in the bath. Yes. Right. And then you say, oh, I have a density of states, which uh, of the system and which is now at V minus Delta V. And then I have the density of states at the uh, of the bath at V plus Delta V. And that's the total density of states. And then you take derivatives and define temperatures. So, okay. right. Yeah. So, 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 but, but, right, we don't have to do that. Um, you can also uh, derive the canonical. So, so this distribution, the canonical distribution, I can also derive from a more um, Gibbs entropy perspective, right? So I know, which is sort of a more information theoretic perspective. So if, if I, I'm trying to find out what probability, what form of a probability um, best, uh, maximizes the entropy subjected to some constraint. And uh, so my S is, Everyone familiar with this? Shannon, yeah. This is the Gibbs entropy, right? And then I want to say normal canonical, the, normally the way I get the canonical uh, distribution is to say now I want to set this to zero, but subject to some constraints. And one constraint that we always have to satisfy is that this is one. And then in a canonical ensemble, I say that the average energy the average energy, so there's some E for this configuration and a P for this configuration, that has that 
average has to be fixed to some average energy. If I do that, then I will end up with a, so here I'm just going to do the same thing, but now V of Ri, P of Ri, and I'm going to fix it to some V. And then if you just go through this uh, yeah. extremization with the Lagrange multiplier, you're going to get a distribution which is e to the minus something. And this x will turn out to be writing this right temperature is Dennis Valley. Yes. So I will and so that will be the definition of X. So this is this is another way to get it. Yeah, this helps. Thanks. Yeah. But 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 everything is based on this idea of equiprobability and our goddessity and dynamically uh, something being conserved. So that's what I wanted to start from and then propose that we start thinking about a slightly different way to approach these granular systems, going back to the kinds of questions we raised in the first lecture, right? So what I'm going to <clears throat> end with this discussion of Edwards is that this was <clears throat> Edwards's proposition was based on this very straightforward generalization of equilibrium statistical mechanics to say whatever dynamics is uh, is uh, appropriate at uh, for these slowly driven granular systems conserves volume and as i was saying yesterday he even went as far as saying i can write down a volume function and think of that as a hamiltonian and write down all of hamiltonian dynamics that was that was his, his sort of uh, broad, very ambitious uh, picture. So I want to get away from this and go back to what uh, some of the things that we, we, well, I pointed out at the first lecture, right? That forces are important. We don't want to get, um, we, the, the interactions between the particles are practically unknowable. So let's just think of these systems from a perspective of what constraints do the particles in the system satisfy. And the kind and I am now going to look at jammed, jammed states. Jammed states for um, <clears throat> hard spheres or hard, like infinitely rigid particles. I'm just going to use hard spheres as a shorthand for that. Means that every part, every particle, or sorry, no particle, no two particles overlap because they are infinitely rigid right there's no no the way, way they can be compressed and we are in a state such that i cannot move one particle without creating an overlap. This was uh, Edwards's definition of a block state, right? Does that make sense? So, so I'm dense. So, you know, if I'm uh, low density, then I can get many, many, uh, then of course, um, I can move particles around without creating the, the overlaps. But if I'm dense enough, then um, I, I could be in states where there are, there are uh, no spaces 
for a single particle to be moved. But I can come up with collective moves that will take me from one of these jam states to another. But I cannot, for certain, move one particle. That was Edwards's um, definition of a block state. So this is an example of a constraint. And I'm actually going to write down the constraint because it, we will um, be using it in a minute. So if I have a bunch of particles at position, center of mass positions are I, and let's say they are diameter, uh, their diameters, because I'm looking at a bunch of um, hard spheres with maybe varying diameters, I want some uh, disorder in this system with diameters di. And these are the center of mass positions. Right? So what we are saying is we have two particles. And these two particles cannot be in this configuration, correct? Because, or they cannot, I can't draw them compressed, but nothing can be compressed. So they are just touching. But there are other particles here in such a way that let's say I cannot move this particle anywhere. I'm not drawing the full system. I cannot move this particle without creating an overlap. Right? So those that's so what how do I write these constraints? So if I look at this particle and this particle, I and J, and they have a contact between them. So I have to say that Rj minus Ri, that distance has to be equal to Dj plus Di over 2. Everyone agree? That's the just touching constraint. It's not that they're farther than where, well, oh, so it's not that there's a gap between them. There is no gap, but there's also no overlap, right? Okay, so, so that's the hard sphere constraint. No forces, no torques yet. How many, where did you, so if I have n particles, In d dimensions, I have then dn degrees of freedom, my, my positions, the positions are right. Yeah? Someone nod or say hi. Yes. Yes. Right, so, OK. Yeah, yeah. And how many constraints do I have? For three particles, three. But so not three, um, because each contact is shared by two particles. NC2, basically, that's it. Uh, so it's just if I have, so in a sort of a mean field sense, if I have Z is the average no number of, uh, this is the average number of contacts per particle. Then if I have n grains, then there are n, z over 2 constraints. Yes? So under what conditions can I satisfy these, uh, these constraint equations? So I have dn degrees of freedom. and n z over n times z over 2 constraints so i need to have n z over 2 less than or equal to dn right to be able to solve for this so that they're not over determined over constraint so this is a condition for hard sphere packings that z has to be less than or equal to 2 times the dimension. And this is absolutely ignoring any ordering. 
it's it, we are saying this is just, so this is where in, in a very mean field way disorder comes into these even very basic considerations that um so in a crystalline state right i can uh, certainly in two dimensions uh, go to to a coordination number of six the hexagonal packing but this is saying there, the, 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 this sort of mean field argument is, is a, in a very rough way putting in the disorder. So we are not looking at any special states which have crystalline order, right? So remember this, so this, so instead of thinking of uh, dynamics, et cetera, let's keep in mind that there are these constraints on hard sphere packings. And I'm going to think into, so if I had hard spheres, if the experiments that were uh, uh, happening in Bob Beringer's lab were actually made out of infinitely rigid particles, then I could never have a Z greater than 2D. So I could never have a number of contacts greater than four in two dimensions or greater than six in three dimensions. Uh, is there also a lower limit of three or? Yeah, so the lower limit doesn't come from the hard sphere path. So the local stability, right? That's what you're talking about, Sanjay? Yeah. Yes, yeah. but that comes from forces. That's uh -huh. not coming from, so that's what I want to get into now, right? So this is, this is the upper limit for hard spheres. Now, of course, if I have soft spheres, I can exceed this limit if I create, and then this is no longer a constraint, right? So, so this, is, this is a strict constraint for infinitely rigid grains and so let's keep that in mind this is absolutely a constraint if my particles are a little bit squishy which most particles will be this is not a, a strict constraint but maybe for <clears throat> particles that are rigid enough it's roughly obeyed, but it's not a constraint. Okay, so now let's actually think about jammed granular packings where I have been arguing. And so let's now imagine that actually I can exert forces which are not, uh, not arbitrary. So for an infinitely rigid grain, uh, since since I can keep, since I can push them um, as much as I want to, and they will not, they'll not be compressed. The force is indeterminate. The force can be anything from zero to infinity. So that's not a very realistic system, as you saw in the photoelastic experiments. Right, the forces can be measured, and the forces do vary. They do. They're extremely sensitive to small compressions because they're they're rough they they are pretty stiff so if i compress them just a little bit the forces might go up a lot but i do need to bring in to understand these granular systems i do need to bring in the concept of forces and torque so so that's what the uh, sanjeev's question pertains to that so let me actually bring in uh, a picture that i I have now learned to do this. Right, so imagine this is a granular packing and I have intentionally created some overlaps to say this is not infinitely rigid. But this is not a bad representation of a 2D granular, 2D packing. And I have also the, for later uses, uh, drawn particles uh, at the boundary in orange, particles inside in white, we will revisit that. But the green lines here is what I want to focus on now, right? So the green lines are the contacts. And on each contact, I have a force which is a vector it doesn't have to be along this green line because i have friction then i can have tangential forces so there are two variables that sit on every contact the contact vector 
which is this green line joining the two points, that vector, and a force that sits on it. So this is what I meant very early on when I was saying well, well, in defining the microstates of granular particles, of granular uh, of grains, I cannot simply specify the positions. If I just simply uh, specify the positions, I can certainly get RC, right? So RC, if this is grain, grain I and grain J is going to be just RJ minus RI. But I don't know the force law, right? That was the whole point of what I was arguing, showing you these rough surfaces and complicated things at the surfaces. I don't know what the, there's no potential that tells me what the force is if I give you the position. So I need to think of these forces as independent variables. So let's now think about um, what constraints have to be satisfied by the forces. So I have defined jammed states as Right, so I've defined jammed states as states that are in mix, or I don't know if I have. Uh, so jammed states, from this perspective, are states in mechanical equilibrium. So that means that on every particle, I have force balance. On every grain, I have force balance and torque balance, correct? Because it's in mechanical equilibrium. It's not going, it's not moving. In addition, there are also, there might be other constraints. So for frictional systems, um, if since these are in static equilibrium, the tangential component of the force has to be less than or equal to the friction coefficient uh, times the normal force. And if I have purely repulsive, so dry grains, then I also know that the normal force is one-sided. It's not like a spring. It only resists compression, doesn't resist pulling apart at all. And with my convention, I, that would be um, saying that the normal forces are positive. Right, so is it clear that the, the way I'm going to set up the problem now is to say, the way we should try to do statistical mechanics of granular packings is to think in terms of the constraints they satisfy and not, and not uh, focus on uh, just the positions and uh, say, oh, I actually know what the forces are given the particle positions. So then the task before us is to say, okay, if these are the <clears throat> constraints that, that have to be satisfied by every grain in my system, what kinds of collective behavior do they exhibit, right? So what are the emergent properties of packings that satisfy all of these constraints? And the reason they have collective behavior <clears throat> is because there are many, many, many possible configurations of these grains that I have drawn on the right, which satisfy these constraints. If there was only one configuration that satisfied this constraint, then I don't have an ensemble, I don't have any fluctuations. So the fluctuations um, are a consequence of the fact. How I create those fluctuations is a separate question, <clears throat> 
but the fluctuate the fact that i can have fluctuations are a consequence of the fact that i have a huge degeneracy of states that satisfy these constraints so that's sort of the uh, the the um, the approach that we have been taking and that's what i will expand on um on today and and tomorrow and then the final lecture hopefully you'll see what we've been able to get out of it so going back to this counting let's see how this force and torque balance right so am i so is the approach sort of making sense so i don't want to think about uh um a hamiltonian system or a system where <clears throat> i can actually write down a free energy from a traditional perspective you'll see there are things analogous to free energies but i want to think of this as a constraint satisfaction problem and most of the lecture today i will actually devote to a much simpler problem which i want to use as an illustrative example of how we think of these systems and a lot of people here know about those systems for certain but let me just pause and see if there's any quick question so what is the the force convention exactly so between i and j it's the force so there's uh, always newton's third law right so so the way i'm uh, so the 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 convention is the force if i look at gray, grain i then the force exerted by grain j on grain i So on each contact, you're very right, right? There are two forces. There's the force exerted by J on I and the force exerted by I on J. Yeah. So, so to make this all makes um, sort of hold together when we think in terms of um, constructing a, a proper um, uh, ensemble is we come up with a convention saying we go around each grain in a counterclockwise direction. Okay. And then the force acting on grain <clears throat> I is the one pointing inwards. And now if I do this grain, right? Okay. I go around this, then it will be the opposite. Okay, right, yeah. Okay, so the first thing I want to do was there another question? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. So, how is the torque arising in this system? Can you please explain that? Oh, so I will write down what the forces and torques are. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, that will be that. So, there's a torque. Uh, so, on grain I, so I have a number of contacts here, right? So, let's say if I'm looking at grain I, I have one, two, three, four contacts. And I'm going to look at all of the contacts of that grain I. And I have a contact vector that is, again, I have to follow a convention. So let's say the contact vector, the convention I'm following is uh, the vector connecting I to J. So it's pointing this way. And then I have just following what we Abhishek and I were just saying, there was a contact vector, uh, there's a contact force, which is exerted by J on I, right? So this is the torque, this is the total torque exert on grain I, and that has to be zero. Right, because the forces are acting at a distance from the center of mass of the grains. So if yes, I have yes, a- Yes, yes, I've got it. Right? Okay. So if I have a grain, for example, uh, if I if I put uh, a force on like this, that the torque is absolutely non-zero, right? So this is actually an interesting configuration, um, which we might discuss on the last day. Here, I could make these forces equal, right? So there is no net force on the grain, but there is a net torque on the grain. So if you think in terms of force densities and torque densities, there is a torque. 
And this is absolutely not allowed, right, for frictionless. Because I cannot have tangential forces, right? So there is there are no, no, no torques there. Okay, so the first thing I want to do uh, before uh, spending a little more time on, um, so since I've done this already, let me also write down the constraint of uh, force balance. Again, all contacts. So I have one, so these equations are for each grain, right? So if I have n grains, I have a force balance equation and a torque balance equation for each grain. Okay, so now let's first, uh, so now let's extend this uh, constraint counting and con number of contacts argument because uh, even though I won't use it very much, that's a very uh, powerful way of thinking about rigidity of these systems um, in terms of the number of contacts, or the average number of contacts they have. So just a reminder, right, Z has to be less than or equal to 2D if from the hard sphere constraint. But now I'm going to look at the force and torque balance constraint. And I'm first going to do friction less, which means there's no torque balance. There's just a force balance. So now I'm thinking of my forces as the degrees of freedom. Here I was thinking of the positions as the degrees of freedom and the constraints on it, right? Now the force balance, I'm thinking of the forces as my degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom I have is if I have average Z contacts per grain, this is the number of degrees of freedom. And how many equations do I have? And these are the constraints. Right, so now instead of dn degrees of freedom, which were the positions of the grains, I have zn over two degrees of freedom, which are the, the contact forces. And here I just have one contact force because there's no tangential force. So I just have a magnitude of the force along that direction. These are the degrees of freedom. And the number of constraints I have is D times N. Right, one for each component of the force and for every grain. So now it's completely reversed the row. So now Zn over two has to be greater than or equal to Dn. So this is the number of degrees of freedom. These are the number of constraints. I'm pointing and you're not seeing. These are the number of degrees of freedom. This is the constraints. So this has to be satisfied for force balance in frictionless. So now do you see something interesting? Which is if I had frictionless hard spheres, what can I say about the contacts, this average number of contacts? Let's put those two constraints together, right? So the hard sphere constraint is Z has to be less than or equal to 2D. The force balance constraint is Z has to be greater than or equal to 2D. So there's only one Z at which frictionless hard spheres can be jammed. And of course, it's not, cannot be infinitely rigid because then the concept of force doesn't make any sense. But if I, if I, if I get to sort of that limit of infinite rigidity in that limit, these packings can only exist at z equal to 2d. And this, these packings are known as isostatic or marginal. 
patterns. I'll not spend too much time talking about this, but I wanted to mention this. Right, so frictionless, hard, so, so basically what you're saying is if you come from very low density, densities and compress your hard spheres, um, add a certain number of contacts, Z equal to 2D, uh, your hard spheres will jam because I cannot increase Z beyond that. If I start from um, slightly soft spheres and I have, over, I have over compressed them, so I could do that, and then I slowly reduce the compression until they reach just touching states. That has to be z equal to 2d. So just touching, but still I cannot move the particles without creating overlaps, uh, are, are these isostatic marginal packings, which have lots and lots of interesting properties. Okay, I'm going to go a little further and then. Um... Ma'am? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I could not follow how uh, the degree of freedom is becoming sedan by two. Oh, these are the number of contacts. So, how many contacts do I have in my packing? Each contact is... is shared by two grains. Yeah. So I have Zn over two contacts, right? So this is the, the this is the number of contacts in my system. And on each yeah. contact, I have a magnitude of a force. It's just frictionless. So the con the the force is always along the contact vector. Okay. Right, so so maybe I should I should I, I can I can clarify a little bit more by for so frictionless particles basically it's saying this is what I want to satisfy. Right? The direction of the force is always along the contact vector. And that contact vector I can get from my positions. So that's uh, so. So again, reiterating the microstates that I'm thinking of that uh, I have. My microstates are specified by giving all positions, and for frictionless particles, just the magnitudes of the contact forces. Does that make sense? So here, uh, the degree of freedom becomes the number of uh, contacts I have in the system because it's fixed. Those are the num uh, so th those are the number of FCs that I have to determine, right? So there are th there are two degrees of two kinds of degrees of freedom. There is this one and this one, right? The RIs and the FCs. Yeah. And so. So the force balance constraints, so the hard sphere constraints are constraints on the RI degrees of freedom, and the force balance constraints are constraints on the FCs, these. Okay, yeah. So, so what we are trying to uh, uh, this this counting is saying under what circumstances, given the constraints, is it possible for me to determine R and Ris and FCs? And if yeah. I if I have Z n over two less than or equal to D n, then I don't have enough equations to determine the FCs. yeah okay yes okay okay so you can you can now generalize this to and i'll leave that as an exercise so i can you can generalize this to uh include torques 
and this is what uh, Sanjeev was talking about. And let's, for simplicity, take um, infinite friction coefficient. That's the only place I can actually uh, do this constraint counting. So this constraint of ft less than or equal to mu fn then becomes irrelevant, correct? Because ft can be anything. So on each contact now, how many degrees of freedom do I have? Two, right? Ft and fn. So you can do that, so you can do what I just did for frictionless, and I leave it as a tutorial exercise for tomorrow. But you now also have to impose, so in addition to force balance, you have to also impose torque balance. And again, you think of these uh, um, FTs and FNs and, as your unknowns, and uh, you ask, what's the... Um, what condition does the average number of contacts have to satisfy? And what you will find is, sorry, do that. What you will find is that Z will has to be has to be greater than or equal to D plus one. This is for frictional now. Frictional infinite friction. So that already tells us that there are some qualitative differences between frictional and frictionless. So let me just, uh, uh, so the crucial one, so the two, two big ones are that there are torque densities in frictional packings. Or what I mean by that is um, I, there can be torques, it, even though, so right, so it's, it's sort of an interesting um, feature that I can have torques, but the torques have to add to zero surrounding a grain. So if I take a loop, and if the loop encloses a complete grain, then the torque has to add up to zero. But if I have a loop that cuts through contacts, and doesn't uh, include a complete grains, includes partial grains like the boundary I have here, the red boundary, then the, there will be a, a torque on that boundary. But the bulk torque will be zero because the torques have to add up to zero. So that's actually an interesting aspect that I don't want to get into today, but uh, hopefully uh, the final lecture will uh, see some uh, aspects of that. So there's torque densities, and then if I, even go to this hard uh, particle limit, right? Now we see something quite interesting. Now we are saying for friction less, Z has to be greater than or equal to D plus one and less than or equal to 2D. So there's actually a range. Whereas for friction less, Z could only be equal to 2d right so there there is there is room for fluctuations of z in friction in frictional hard sphere packings i will not ever go into this hard sphere limit but it's an idealization that definitely is very helpful right so the the kinds of margin so the concept of isostaticity that there's a unique point where I can satisfy both the constraints of uh, force balance and the hard sphere constraint um, is, is, rele is relevant for frictionless. For frictional, uh, it's, uh, it's this whole range of Z that we can have. And there's, if, I, if, I have, uh, if I don't have infinite friction, then there's a kind of uh, uncertainty that comes in the packings which is not um, which do doesn't appear in frictionless and what, what i'm trying to say 
is if I have mu is finite, then I have this constraint that ft is less than or equal to the less than or equal to mu fn, right? It's an upper bound. So then if I'm doing constraint counting, just from a constraint counting perspective, there are two kinds of contacts. Let me see if I can draw a few. So I'm just going to assume some. So let's say on this, um, this contact that I have circled in blue, ft is actually equal to mu n. ft is equal to mu fn. On those contacts, then, I have only one unknown because ft is determined once fn is known, right? So the constraint counting, to do the precise constraint counting, I need to know. And there's no rule. There's nothing that tells me how many of these contacts are saturated, are at this marginal point. So in addition to knowing if I actually want to use this approach, to calculate if a system is in is rigid or not, then I have to know how many marginal contacts I have. These these are saturated. Let me use the word saturated contacts. So friction brings in subtleties into this counting that uh, has not been completely explored yet. So in what I am, we have been doing, we've been taking a much more coarse grained approach, but this kind of counting which is called Maxwell counting, which has, led, which has developed into a very robust framework for frictionless systems uh, has, is still sort of its in, in infancy uh, for frictional systems because of these subtleties of um, the, the ability to have uh, a range of Zs, the fact that I don't know um, a priori how many saturated contacts I have. So in some way, that's sort of, in my way of thinking about it, another, um, sort of noise in the system. I don't know how many saturated contacts I have. Sorry, I'm seeing, I just saw a chat. Up. Oh, um, so, so uh, below D plus one, I cannot uh, satisfy force balance. So I have to have at least D plus one. So I cannot have a system in mechanical equilibrium for Z less than D plus one. And above 2D, if these are hard spheres, I cannot go. But if they're slightly soft, that upper limit, so this upper limit is for both for frictionless and frictional, is only uh, relevant uh, for uh, infinitely rigid grains. But, you can imagine that you cannot exceed this limit by very much. Like it, this is sort of a soft limit if you don't have infinitely rigid grains. But again, as I keep emphasizing, if you want to follow this approach, which is a very robust sort of um, uh, linear algebra counting kind of approach to granular mechanics or now even crystalline like topological mechanics, then um, idealizing systems to hard spheres helps. But in the kinds of systems that uh, we are interested in, they're never strictly hard spheres. But um, people do simulations of hard spheres and see lots and lots of uh, uh, effects that are very similar to experimental measurements, uh, especially in these suspensions that I talked about just a little bit, where you had this a jump in the viscosity, hard sphere simulations actually reproduce most of the observations. So it's, um, so it's not a bad approximation. Uh, Bulbul, I, uh, uh, I had a question. So 
Yeah. Supposing in so in two D, it seems like uh, uh, it's so for the infinite friction case, the average coordination is between three and four. Three and four. Four. Yes. Right? So which right. means like you're saying, if I uh, packed uh, disks in uh, like hard disks with a lot of friction, then this is the stable structure. Uh, this is what would be stable. Right, that's what uh, it, the stable thing would have some coordination number between three and four between three and four three and four okay yes. but what is a bit surprising is that if i had uh supposing uh i had coordination number four now even after introducing friction somehow that becomes unstable right i mean like i would have expected that it that should continue to be uh, I think you're uh, uh i think that's uh i i think those are still going to be stable it's just that I think it's sort of the other way around, right? Um, that by introducing friction, I can go get to lower yeah. contact numbers, which is why I get the features of this random loose packings, which are much looser packings. The packing fraction can be reduced. Okay. Uh... So, so if I if I created a friction null packing, and this actually people can do. Um, so if you create a frictional packing, then you can sort of, um, they call it releasing the friction by sort of gently tapping the contacts. So the tangential forces go away. And then those packings become unstable and the, they, will, they will densify if you let them. Okay, okay. So this is, this is why there's a concept of random loose packing And this is one way, right? So going back to my first plot here, the thing that we were talking about, right? These are frictional, right? So you're going between sort of random loose packing, mm -hmm. random closed packing, and even higher if you keep ordering. But the fact that you can do this, like for frictionless, I would never be able to go to 0.59. This okay. lower branch, so that's another interesting oh, okay, thing, right? Okay. This lower branch probably doesn't exist for frictionless. Okay, so for frictional guys, I mean, like you can get anything between three and four. In 2D and then between uh, the four and um, four and six. Yeah, four and six in 3D, right? Okay. Yeah. As without any order. Now, if you order, then you can definitely try and get, get yeah. more. So the, yeah, this kind of uh, constraint counting uh, for frictional, I have been exploring with collaborators, but it's, uh, it's still uh, very much um, up in the air. Uh, there's also, of course, torque if you don't have spheres, right? But but the the forces are still frictionless, so that's a different counting. So that doesn't that uh, does not uh, uh, take it down to d plus one. Okay, let me pause and take questions from the chat. Yes, it is definitely possible to form hexagons. That's what I was saying. So, but hexagons are so are special um, and can be formed only in monodispersed systems in two D. So you avoid. So we we are looking at disordered systems, and as, uh, some by some means, Hooker Crook, we have introduced disorder by let's say introducing polydispersity or Red, you know, something. Uh, so yes, we are at, that's why I keep saying ordered structures can have much, much larger Z, but, uh, but not disordered structures. Okay, so without any order means uh, no periodic structures or locally, even locally ordered structures local orientation order local translational order so um, so right so 
I can create perfect hexagonal packings or I can get create packings which have hexagonal orientational order, but maybe not long range translational order. So any kind of local order um, ruins this uh, very mean field counting. It doesn't ruin everything, but it does ruin this kind of very mean field counting. So uh, this counting only works if you say there's no local order anywhere. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, for the last 20 minutes or so, I now want to introduce, um, let me just, maybe I'll just draw this again. I'm going to um, introduce an extensive quantity which is much more amenable to thinking about as an analog of a conserved quantity. And what I mean by conserved, I think we'll barely touch on today, uh, but I'll do it, uh, I'll try to, try to at least give you a hint. So, uh, so I'm saying let's not use, so of course energy is not conserved. Like it doesn't even mean anything for us. Uh, I am saying let's not think about volume. So throw volume out also. Is there another extensive quantity that makes sense to think about as something that's, uh, and again, I, I will use the word conserved, that, that, that for now, let's just say, can I construct another quantity that is extensive and captures information about the forces and the torques in the system? Let's just ask that. And then the conservation of that will be, um, will become clearer by the end of this lecture, hopefully. So what I can do is I've already introduced, right? Uh, two vectors that live on every contact. Right, so on every contact, I have two vectors that live on it. From these two, I can construct a quantity, a tensor, that I will call Sigma C, it's a tensor, and it's just the outer product of RC and FC. So on each contact, I can construct this. I can coarse grain this quantity by summing over all the contacts inside this box that I have drawn in red. Right, so I'm going to construct this coarse grained quantity for a box, which I'm going to call capital sigma, which is sum over all contacts inside this box. Two things that I want you to notice. Um, one and and why this is this is uh, why this uh, this um, quantity is uh, particularly useful should become clearer. But it is defined this way. It's certainly an extensive quantity. If I divide it by the volume of the box, this would be the stress tensor. But I'm not dividing by the volume of the box or the area of the box, and this in the literature is called the force moment tensor. It's an extensive quantity and intriguingly, it has the same dimensions as energy. It's not the energy, but it has the same dimensions as energy. 
so what else can we say about this uh, this quantity? One. So it's it's, it's a tensorial quantity. Um, I I can construct this coarse grained. Uh, I can keep increasing the volume and it, it, it should scale as the number of contacts, which then scales extensively uh, with the volume of my system. So it's an extensive quantity. I can also define a slightly different way of course, uh, of course, grain, or oh, let me, let me, uh, let me skip that for the moment. Okay, so uh, any questions about this? And I see one in the chat, or no. Any questions? Uh, so it's the, uh, so basically you are sum, summing up the kind of uh, torques on every contact, right? Uh, so it's the outer product. It's not just the torque. It's a full tensor. Okay, right, yeah, okay. It's All the right. full tensor. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, uh, so that's the interesting thing, right? So the question I can ask whether this tensor is symmetric or not. And uh, around, if I take the contacts around one grain, so if I say, oh, my box that I'm doing the sum over is only one grain, right? So I can do that. I can take this to be, if I construct the capital sigma for this grain, then the fact that the torques actually add up to zero on this grain will give me a symmetric tensor. But if I take an arbitrary boundary, like this red one, which is you know not, has some partial uh, grains in it, the tensor will not be symmetric. This is sort of an interesting feature that we'll uh, come to later on. But torque balance is there, certainly exists in the bulk. So, um, so as long as my system is large enough and I'm in, and my boundary is small compared to the to the bulk, then this is a symmetric tensor because of force balance of uh, torque balance. And Bulbul, this discussion now is uh, specific to 2D uh, or it's general? No, no it's general. It's general, completely okay. general. It's uh, 2D and 3D, uh, okay. completely general. So this, so now, right, so I have defined this, this, uh, this quantity, but I also know that force, force balance and torque balance are satisfied on every grain. And I just outlined, and so we just discussed the, the, the torque balance. Oops. Do this. That's the torque balance because of the symmetry of the tensor. In the bulk, this is, um, so if the boundaries are irrelevant, then I have a symmetric tensor. What might the force balance be telling us about this tensor? We can think from continuum, or I can um, I can do it from discrete. So from continuum, it's just an expression of um, uh, momentum conservation, momentum balance, and it should it tells me that this is zero. So writing in components because this is a tensor, it's zero if I don't have any body forces, external forces. So this is zero with no, let's say no gravity. If I had gravity, then I would have some force acting on every grain um, and that will give me something on the right-hand side. So in a continuum sense, um, once I have coarse grained this, and actually this, this works at the grain level too, um, at every level, the divergence of the stress tensor is zero. The divergence of this force moment tensor. Uh, 
So I have a quantity which is symmetric except for boundary terms and its divergence is zero. And so what I will argue is this, this is, this is going to be the lecture, uh, the last two lectures completely will be devoted to this, that this divergence of sigma zero and sigma symmetric leads to a kind of generalized Maxwell theory. So a kind of electromagnetism or a gauge theory, which is emerging here from constraints. So roughly speaking, right, if I, if I just told you instead of divergence of some tensor being zero, divergence of the electric field is zero, then I know I have charge conservation and that's a conservation law and we can write it in terms of E and I'll get into that uh, uh, more generally uh, tomorrow. But this, is, this, this way of thinking about conservation is very different from the dynamical conservation laws that we were, uh, that sort of uh, prompted people like Edwards to propose an ensemble. So if I have five minutes or 10, uh, I can pause here or I can introduce, uh, the way I want to um, talk about uh, what, what, how to think about this, this kind of conservation principles our emergent gauge theories is going to uh, was going to focus on a much better studied, much more well defined systems, which are classical sort of frustrated magnets. But I can wait and do that tomorrow, and maybe maybe takes take some pause for five minutes. I don't know. What do you think, Abhishek? Uh, yeah, I guess maybe we can. Yeah, Ooh. let me stop sharing screen and see if I can see some faces and uh... <laughs> can you explain why divergence of sigma is zero? Uh, so that's the, uh, well, you can think of it just as momentum conservation. Uh, right, momentum, so divergence of the stress tensor is the time derivative of the momentum. Which is the net force on a system, but you can I can also get it just by from coarse graining up from the grain level. Like I can define a network divergence, which are known. Uh, 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 you can define the divergence operator on this random network, and then you can uh, I can show that because the forces on the grains add up to zero. Right, roughly speaking, you see the can you see the picture? the forces on the grains add up to zero. Yes, yes. So the divergence of this quantity that I am putting on the grain has to be zero. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, I got, yeah, yeah. So the, the uh, and just for the definition, this uh, the stress tensor was defined in, not, in uh, it, it wasn't a cross product, right? It was direct product, like XI. It's a direct product, it's a uh -huh. tensor. Yeah, it's a direct product of R and F. Okay. And from the exact definition, one can check that this is true, this uh, cross. That this is the stress tensor? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can do, right. So, it, so the normally we define stress tensor by looking at a boundary and putting the forces. Yeah. It, uh, it's the same definition. It's the same definition. It's, it's, it, 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 they're equivalent. Yeah. So, so, um, so this, this kind of conservation laws are well known in, um, or this, so as I hinted, you'll see that there's a, there's a, um, there's an emergent kind of Maxwell theory like Coulomb's law, but for these tensors, uh, 
But the emergence of these kinds of Maxwell theories, um, usual Maxwell theories, are well known in classical spin systems that are frustrated. So I think uh, uh, starting with that, uh, uh, tomorrow's lecture my, is probably better than me transitioning uh, today. So I can, we can, we have 10 minutes. We, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> so, so there, okay, there are two, the two possibilities, right? Things are clear, or things are absolutely unclear. Uh, so, this in experiments, apart from these uh, photo spheres, uh, this is the only system where one can measure this, or is there any other system? Measure forces? Can yeah. you measure forces? No, people, also, people. the uh, this contact, average contacts, etc. Like. Uh, Oh, the contacts people can measure. Um, well, sorry, yes and no. Contacts people have made much better uh, progress on. 2D. By... No, in 3D. In uh -oh. 3D by, so um, uh, the Cornell group, Itai Cohen, they have figured out a way of, um, as they do their particle tracking, to actually track contacts by doing something that I, it's called something that I've forgotten. Uh, but measurement of forces is, is is much more difficult. So right, so so our intent as theorists should be to predict things that people can measure. Um, and so, even if you cannot measure the forces inside, I should be able to predict what the response should be to a stress, right, to an external force or correlations of the stress that one can measure by even looking at the boundaries. Um, so, so, so that's, that's what, um, uh, that, 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 that should be our focus, right? So the, the test, sort of the detailed tests of the theory can only happen through simulations or experiments where they can measure, um, measure these forces, but it, if it's restricted just to that, then of course it doesn't, it's not very useful. Uh, uh, can you explain wherein the argument was disorder implied? It, it's just that I'm throwing, um, Um, in the in the so so the way let me put it this way the only uh, the only um, considerations we used in this average z argument is uh, are the constraints of force and torque balance or hard spheres right now. If I have ordered, uh, oh, sorry, I should have. So, uh, I, I brush something slightly under the rug. When I said, let's say for frictionless systems, um, I have uh, dn constraints, right? The forces have to add up to zero. The assumption was, that these contact vectors, the RCs, are completely uncorrelated. Because if they were correlated, like in a hexagonal packing, then of course I don't have that many independent constraints. Does that make sense? Right? So, so let's say I knew the packing was hexagonal. Then the force balance, then um, for the even though I have these many contacts and I have the forces are unknown, I know because of the directionality, right? That if, uh, if I knew, let's say one half of this, I know the other forces. The, if, if, so the assumption is these contact vectors are uncorrelated. The forces are not correlated at all. Whereas in a hexagonal packing, the forces are correlated. So I don't have as many independent constraints. So I don't have dn constraints. I have fewer constraints. Um, 
does that answer uh, Ashwin does that answer your question I can have different yeah I'm not saying um, so I can take a hexagonal packing and say I don't know the forces on those six the, the forces are still unknown because I have all kinds of particle properties that I didn't know but I don't have um, not all six contact forces are are um, not uh, the but the contact forces are related to each other because if I have two you know these two contacts are uh, are along the same direction or these two contacts are along the same direction so then I don't have as many uh, as many um, constraints on them if I just constrain one half of it then the rest are no I'm not saying the forces are no the forces are can still be unknown people actually work on this thing called the force network ensemble where they say on a hexagonal packing how many configurations can I uh, how many diff or what different force configurations can I have that all satisfy the constraints of force balance you still can have many 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 right but but um but i don't have as many equations to satisfy for that because um because the contact vectors are correlated hopefully that makes sense i can i can illustrate this um uh, Like even if you just take so just think about it if you uh, if maybe try to work it out in the tutorial if you take a hexagonal packing and say okay i have i certainly have as many contacts as uh, um so three per particle right so zn over two um do i have that many independent constraints or is it uh, is it fewer than that Or, or do I have six, um, do I have three independent forces or not? So it's, it's, we are ignoring all correlations. Your microphone is not working, that's okay. Uh, keep asking. Yeah, the total force needs to be zero. That's a constraint. That's the constraint. But, but the point is, I'm assuming here that um, the forces on every contact are un completely uncorrelated. And that's not true if I have ordered structures. That's, the, that's my short answer. Okay, so I think there are no... Uh... Doesn't look like it. So we'll start tomorrow. I'll actually start with the, the simple spin model uh, analysis and then we'll uh, transition. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye.